Hey Fishtube, Steven here, and I have a plant problem. And that plant problem is, I have a lot of plants, and they grow, and I just can't bear to throw them away. For a while, I was all about the plants for profit, but after the time spent listing them, the fees, the shipping, and oh my god, the customer service. <laughs> I do have a day job, so I can't really justify selling plants as a hobby. I'd rather just send them to my friends and help them grow plants too. And before long, everyone I know will have live plants in their aquariums, and they'll love it so much that they'll send plants to all their friends and then their friends send it to their friends. Like a pyramid scheme, except nobody's life gets ruined. Instead, we are all winners, and by winners, I mean plants, mother- So, I decided to start a tank fully dedicated to growing plants that I like, and that I think people will have the least amount of difficulty with. And while I don't intend to sell these on the open market, like I said, it's the same principle as a plants for profit tank. The goal here is volume, so that means fast growing plants that are easy to propagate, uh, for the most part. Not all of them, but we'll get to that later. Let's start with the tank a 40 breeder. Why a 40 breeder? Well, because I don't have room for a 60 breeder. Because what you want is a tank with the most area on the bottom. That's the space we need for plant volume and propagation. A 40 gallon breeder is a common size. It's probably very easy to find at your local big box store. And for this general size, it has the right footprint for maximizing plant growth. Just going from a standard 29 gallon to a 40 breeder gives you 80% more surface area on the bottom. And going from from the 40 breeder footprint to a standard 55 gallon, you'll actually lose space. So we have maximum area for plants in a three foot tank, plus it's shorter in height than a 29 or a 55, which gives us a greater percentage of light penetration that I do not have the equipment to calculate. But in general terms, you won't need to spend a crap load of money on powerful lighting. And I did go pretty cheap with lighting for a plant farm, a couple of Higer lights, and they're not a sponsor, I bought them on Amazon. Do I recommend them? Uh, no idea but so far so good. Now I already had this four foot higher light that I intended to use for something else, but we're gonna put it on the plant form, it'll do for now. And then I ordered a second light for the back because I want the coverage over the full tank. I intend to use every bit of space available and I wanted a light dedicated to the tall background plants. Speaking of space, this 3D background I made, it takes up a little bit of room. So for a plant farm, maybe it's not practical, but I like it and it's my tank and I make the rules. If you're curious how I made this background, it's super easy and you can watch my video on how to do it yourself. I mean, not now, like watch it later. It's not going anywhere. So let's just finish this video. While we're talking about light, I'll just go ahead and tell you my basic settings. No dimmers, no ramp up periods, no siestas, nothing fancy. Both lights are plugged into a smart power strip with the photo period set for eight hours at maximum brightness. Is this the correct setting? Maybe, maybe not. But you have to start somewhere and eight hours is kind of average for most planted tank setups. Now this is not an invitation to mimic any of my lighting settings. There are way too many variables for that to ever make sense. The only way to figure out the right photo period for your setup is to watch your tank for weeks, maybe months, pay attention to the plants and the level of algae growth and your fertilization, and just make small adjustments and repeat. And now comes the substrate. I'm not going to pretend this is some magic formula for growing plants. There are so many other substrates I have yet to try, but lately I've been messing around with layered substrates. It's just a matter of preference, but my basic recommendations for any substrate for a planet tank are to make it deep and provide some sort of nutrients in the substrate, even if it's just root tabs. I'm starting with a bottom layer of Seachem Fluorite. It's a clay-based substrate that's pretty rich in iron, and iron is important. And no, iron is not what makes your plants red. But along with other micronutrients, it does play a critical role in the formation of chlorophyll. Of course, we don't need that much iron. So while fluorite is a decent gravel, it's not what you'd call a comprehensive aquasoil. Still, I've had good luck using it along with root tabs and other tanks, and I already have it on hand. Now, with regards to rinsing it first, this stuff is dirty, like really freaking dirty. If you add it straight to your aquarium without rinsing it, you're gonna get a pink smoothie and you're gonna have a bad time. But at the same time, you can rinse this stuff over and over and over and still feel like it's not clean. 
We don't really want it to be super clean. Instead, we want to focus on the lighter dust and debris. I do this by rinsing it straight in the bag, letting it fill up and overflow with water until the water runs clear, and that's it. Because all the rest of the muck left in the bag is dense enough to sink, even if you stir it up really bad in your tank, it will sink eventually. Likewise, we're going to do the same rinsing technique for the next layer, Fluval Stratum. This is a more comprehensive aqua soil, and it has the added benefit of being acidic to lower the KH in my water by converting carbonate into CO2, which is a good thing for plants. Now, now, despite how it sounds, lowering your KH will not increase the presence of CO2, but it will increase the bioavailability of it. If you want to go more in depth on this topic, I recommend you check out the live stream series I'm doing with my friend Kelly Foreman called Wet Your Plants. Our first episode is all about water parameters, particularly carbonate hardness or alkalinity, and how it affects your success with a planted tank. Again, don't watch it now. We still have more video here. And now for the sand cap. Carapsea Supernaturals. Not the color I would choose to go with this background, but it's what I have. Black probably would have been better, but I ain't here to impress you with color coordination, okay? We've got a nice deep substrate now, and that's the only kind of substrate I will ever do for a planted tank. Stem plants stay in place much easier without the need for plant weights and everything gets a ton of room for a vast root system. Let's talk about filtration. My initial plan was two sponge filters, but I ended up taking one out and I may very well remove the other one at some point. And here's a brand new AquaClear 50 mounted on the side so that I can push water across the length of the tank. Why? Because plants like flow. It helps distribute nutrients, CO2, oxygen, and move debris and crap away from the leaves. Speaking of CO2, I was gonna just run this like a regular low-tech tank, just to show what you can do without CO2. But then Kelly Foreman, my co-host for that stream I talked about earlier, wet your plants, don't leave yet, watch it later. She was like, the goal of a plant farm is volume. So yeah, duh, I should be running CO2. Basically the easy button for fast, lush growth. Steroids for photosynthesis. It's a hell of a drug. Getting your CO2 set up and optimized is an entirely separate discussion worth its own video or stream. But for now, I'm happy to answer questions about it in the comments. Now it's time to get our plants to plant those plants in the plant farm. So what are we focusing on? Fast and easy. The whole point of growing a bunch of plants and putting them in other people's tanks is to set them up for success. So I want to make sure I'm growing an assortment of plants that tolerate a wide range of water parameters, with none of them requiring CO2 whatsoever. So the back of the tank, well really the back half of the tank, will be all about stem plants with a variety of colors and textures, but with two important things in common. They grow relatively fast and they look great. First, we got Bacopa caroliniana, one of the easiest, most versatile stem plants you can get. Nice, bold green leaves in low light and really big, golden, bright leaves in higher light. But the lighting requirements are so low that you can display the full stem proudly in view without exposing ugly bare stems where more light can't reach, assuming you have a decent amount of light. You might also notice a few stems of various hygrophila species around here, and I'm still debating if I even want to devote space to them. We'll see. Now, we have another species of Hygrophila in here that is by far the easiest one, Hygrophila deformis, or also known as water wisteria. You could call this a low light plant, but because of the wide growth, you're more likely to get leggier stems without enough light getting to the lower leaves. But it is again one of those easy, fast growing stems that will take over your entire background if you want it to. Next to the wisteria, we've got Pogostemon stellatus octopus. Love it or hate it, the leaf structure is unique and the lighting requirements are similar to wisteria. It's sort of a low light plant, but the narrow upper leaves don't block out so much light so you don't get those leggy stems as easily as you would with something like the wisteria. Then we have what is fast becoming my favorite low-tech stem plant, and that is Limnophila sessiliflora. It is the ultimate contrast for literally everything else in the tank. It reminds me a bit of Kabamba, but the lighting requirements for Limnophila sessiliflora are far less demanding. In fact, 
If your light is super high, you can actually burn the fine leaves on this one. And I think a few stems of this in your mid-ground or background would really pop, and once you get it established, it grows hella fast. And finally, to complete this horde of stem plants, we have a crap load of Ludwigia ovalis, Ludwigia repens, and Rotala rotundifolia. This is where you'll get some lovely color contrast out of your aquatic garden without needing to blast it with light. Now these aren't low light plants by any means, but even with medium light, you will get a mixture of pink and red and orange and peach colored leaves from the top growth at least. Let's talk about the foreground. Most of what you see here are just experiments to see what will thrive and propagate the easiest. So starting from the left, we have some corkscrew valisneria plantlets I took from another tank. Valisneria is another one of those easy, fast growers under at least some medium light, but I often hear people say it just doesn't do well in their water. In my experience, Valisneria will do nothing, even melt back for several months sometimes before it decides it's happy and now it's gonna take over the tank. So I guess I'd say even if you think it died on you, just be patient, see what happens, it might come back. Next we have some Vesuvius. It's a sword plant with similar leaves to the corkscrew valve, and it's propagating like crazy already. Special thanks to my friend Brookley for giving me this plant. Now for these other swords. They're tissue cultures that Kelly Foreman sent me as sort of a sharecropping project. Here's a fancy twist sword and then a red diamond sword, and both are doing just fine. The tissue culture leaves have been melting back while new submersed leaves are popping up, which is exactly what you want to see. But let's talk about this one in the middle. Laganandra me boldy eye red, and I don't even care if I said it right. This one arrived with small, delicate roots and bright white leaves. I have no experience with this plant at all, so I didn't know what to expect. Unfortunately, things are not looking great. A couple of the plantlets seem to have a chance at recovering and converting, so here's hoping. So moving on, we have some plugs of Dwarf Sagittarius, a very easy medium to low light carpeting plant. Eventually, this stuff is going to establish in this tank and take off like crazy and dominate every inch of substrate, if I let it. Seriously, it's really invasive. If you want to carpet a tank without high light and CO2, this is the fastest, easiest way to do it. And lastly, that's a ball of java moss, because I can, okay? Now, before we go, I'll briefly touch on fertilization. And mainly, I'm relying on the substrate to give everything a good start without overloading the water column with excess nutrients. Now, the substrate is not going to supply nutrients forever, but I ain't ever changing out this substrate. You shitting me? At that point, it'll be time for root tabs. I do already get the macronutrients, nitrate, phosphate, and potassium in the water column to some degree anyway. I've stocked the tanks with all of the wild type guppy and endler hybrids that I've culled from my live bearer mosh pit just to prevent them from taking over the gene pool in there. And plus, we got a beautiful trio of young Bosmani rainbow fish from the amazing gen generous Maria Z. So the bio load takes care of the nitrogen, my tap water and the flake food take care of the phosphates, a little too much if you ask me, and my tap water, while quite delicious, is annoying and has no shortage of KH but absolutely no calcium or any minerals to speak of. So I have to mineralize the tank with a GH booster and I use one that contains potassium. And for now, there are plenty of micronutrients in the substrate. Once I get the CO2 to a maximum safe level, the only only variable I really intend to mess with is the lighting. I think we're off to a good start, mostly. I'm already about to do some trimming on a few things and either propagate them in this tank or other people's tanks. That's all for now. Subscribe if you want updates on this and other random crap I got going on in this uh, fish house. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you later.